Well, you may be seated. I know that's a little different. But um, we're going to read all of Psalm 119. So, uh, and then I'm going to preach from all of it. So I hope you ate a big breakfast. So here we go. You know, I hear the joke often that pastors work only one hour a week, so I'm going to make up for it this morning with uh, some overtime. So now, it only takes about 13 and a half minutes to read the psalm. I, I timed this, and I went back and forth all week long if I would reach, just read a portion of it or all of it. But um, I want to hear from God and not me this morning. And so uh, this is the only inspired portions of the service when we read God's Scripture, And I hope to be faithful, I long to be for, uh, faithful to God's Word, and I pray that the sermons are faithful to God's Word. But we're going to read it, and so if you've turned there, we're going to be there throughout the morning. And I understand, there's lots of little kids, uh, I understand, um, you know, it's raining, it's a great day for a nap. Uh, and so I, know, I understand the struggle in these things, um, but I think it's uh, important for us to hear God's Word read. Uh, to listen to it, to spend time to it, uh, uh, attending to it. And so um, let's follow along, uh, kids, with your parents. Uh, parents, let's help our kids follow along with us and um, give ourselves to the reading and hearing of God's word from Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous rules. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes, and I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke, you rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your word. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, and I will meditate on your wondrous works. My soul melts away for sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. Put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. I will run in the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the paths of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then shall I have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your rules. I will keep your law continually forever and ever, and I shall walk in a wide place, for I have sought your precepts. I will also speak of your testimonies before kings, and shall not be put to shame. 
For I find my delight in your commandments, which I love. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. Remember your word to your servant, in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from of old, I take comfort, O Lord. Hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. The Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. I entreat your favor with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promise. When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. I hasten and do not delay to keep your commandments. Though the cords of the wicked ensnare me, I do not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous rules. I am a, com a companion of all who fear you, of those who keep your precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of your steadfast love. Teach me your statutes. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. The insolent smear me with lies, but with my whole heart I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Those who fear you shall, rejoice, shall see me and rejoice because I have hoped in your word. I know, O Lord, that your rules are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me. Let your steadfast love comfort me according to your promise to your servant. Let your mercy come to me that I may live, for your law is my delight. Let the insolent be put to shame, because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth, and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. And I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me, but I consider your testimonies. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though your precepts, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet. And a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according, according to your word. Accept my free will offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. 
The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, and for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise, that I may live. And let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up, that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You who spurn all who go astray from, you spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. The unfolding of your words give light. It imparts understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant because I long for your commandments. Turn to me and be gracious to me, as is your way with those who love your name. Keep steady my steps according to your promise. And let no iniquity get dominion over me. Redeem me from man's oppression, that I may keep your precepts. Make your face shine upon your servant and teach me your statutes. My eyes shed streams of tears because your people do not keep your law. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried, and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise up before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love, O Lord. According to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commandments. Consider how I love your precepts. And give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and any, every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth speech, praise, for you teach me your statutes. My, will, my tongue will sing of your word. 
for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your delight. Your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Psalm 119, the word of God for his people today. Let's pray and ask for his help. So, Father, we know how often we do go astray like lost sheep. We praise you that you are a God who seeks your people. So help our lips pour forth praise. Let our cry come before you that you would give us understanding according to your word this morning. May we hope in it, delight in it, love it, treasure it, take joy in it, find it sweet. Find our security and hope in it. May we be people who rise before dawn to find our hope in you, to hope in your words. And may we be people who long into the night meditate on your promises. We praise you that you are near, that you are not far off, but near to us, that you have given us your word. So teach us this morning, we ask. Give us life according to your ways. We long for you to come and help us. We need you to come and help us. We pray that you would teach us your truth this day and give us life according to your steadfast love. Amen. So who is the church? It's the series that we're in now. And we've seen over and over that the church are the people of God. And the church becomes the people of God by the word of God. We saw that last week in John 15, especially verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. This cleansing word Jesus spoke was all that he proclaimed of who he is and what he was coming to do, and what he did come to do on earth. And now Holy Spirit then takes that word spoken, the gospel, and effectively cleanses God's people by speaking to them this word and causing them to have faith in Jesus apart from any work of their own. And so our sin left us separated from God and under his just judgment. But for the glory of his grace to be displayed, God chose to save a people back to himself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he did it through the speaking of this word, the gospel. And the God of the Bible, as we see from the very first pages, is the God who speaks. Our God speaks. He's a speaking God. And he speaks first. He doesn't wait for us to come and seek him. He speaks first. He acts first. He calls first. He gives grace first. And God's speaking first is the grace we need to daily live with him as his people in his world. And I pray that even though it took a little bit of time this morning, in the grand scheme of our days, it doesn't really take that much time. We spend far much more time watching Netflix or listening to the news than it took to even read the entire psalm. And so I pray that we just don't ever lose the wonder that God didn't just create everything and then leave us to ourselves or leave us to seek him, but that he is a speaking God, that he has revealed himself through his word. I wonder how many copies of God's word you have in your home. I wonder how many copies, translations you have on your phone. You may have it in your pocket. You may be looking at it right now. You can have it wherever you go. But I think this ease of use and mobility is one way Satan tempts us to lose the wonder that our God has spoken to us, and we have it in his word. You can look up a verse, right? Like you look up a random headline or something that you just can't remember or you don't recall anymore because you don't have to because anytime you have any question, you don't have to look it up. You just ask Google. Or we can look up Bible verses like we look up sports scores or whatever your friends are posting on social media. And so we're tempted to treat God's word like every other app on our phone. And we forget the sacrifice it took to have God's word in our language. The saints who've gone before us died to have the Bible in the language of the people. And forgetting the plight of our brothers and sisters around the world who have little or zero access to God's word. 
And I praise God for those technologies that allow the numerous ways we can access His Word. But brothers and sisters, <laughs> access isn't the point. I mean, what good is access to a treasure of great spoil if you never enjoy it? I remember growing up on cartoons myself. So it's okay, we can watch TV. Not, not bashing any enjoyment of any good things in this world. But, you know... Uh, Scrooge McDuck, right, used to jump into his pile of gold coins and swim around in it all the time. He didn't just have treasure, he enjoyed it. Listen to Psalm 119, verse 162. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. We have access to great spoil. Are we people who don't just have access to it, but enjoy it? I mean, what an amazing grace it is that our God is the God who speaks and who reveals himself to his people by his word and who communes with his people through his word. So I've chosen Psalm 119 for us today as it's a psalm entirely about God's word, about God in his word, and it invites us to the joy of living as people of God's word. And meaning the church is then the one people, the distinguished people among all the peoples of the world who live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. That that's what defines us. That's who we are. Makes us different from all the peoples around us. We live on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And Psalm 119 helps us to do that as it recalls the past and it grounds us then in the present and helps us look to the future. So those are our three points this morning, past, present, and future, quite simply. Or again, God's word, it recalls the past, and grounds us in the present as we look towards the future. So first, God speaks so we recall the past. Recalling the past does not mean uh, just remembering it in sentimental ways. Recalling uh, the past means that we Look to see what this God has spoken, that there is a God who speaks, that this God is ultimate reality. God is the main character of this journey we find ourselves on called life. And this God, who is ultimate reality, has revealed himself through his word. And as you heard read this morning, there are eight different synonyms for God's word in this psalm. And the most frequent one that's used is the word for law. It's the word Torah. And often when we hear the word law, we think of legalistic concepts and commandments. But generally, the word Torah referred to the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. And so those books in which God reveals himself to Israel, makes those covenants with them, tells them how to live with them, equips them to live with this speaking, covenant-making, promise-making God through his commandments, to live as his people. So when we have that reference, these first five books generally, and not just the specific commandments in our heads, it helps us understand the psalm better. What do we see in God's word of his past actions in those first five books of the Old Testament that equip us to live as his people? There's many things, but I just want to point out a couple. One, we see that God is creator. When we look to the past, we see that there is a God, and he is the creator. Look at verse 73. Your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. So we believe here at Five Points that God created all things. But do we live like it? We, we, do we say we believe in creation? in a creating God, but then live according to evolutionary principles like survival of the fittest? I mean, life is not found outside of our Creator. You have made me. You have fashioned me. I can't learn anything apart from your hand guiding me, teaching me. So life is found in living according to this creating God's way by His grace. So as we recall that there is a creating God who, who has made and fashioned us lovingly, then we can begin to live in the present as if this world isn't out of control. That your survival isn't based on your power or your strength or your intellect or your wealth or your achievements. And we know that because, two, this creating God ordered his world. Life is found in relation to the creator God in his ordered world. 
So we see in Psalm, or verse 152, long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. So this creating God ordered his world with testimonies that are founded forever. We live in a world where news travels fast, and more information than any, ever before is available at your fingertips. And our culture says that to be the most relevant people is to be the most up-to-speed people on the latest headlines, on the latest going-ons in our world, on the funniest memes and the best Netflix shows. But the most relevant people in all the world are those people who know God's enduring revelation. This is enduring truth. This creating God ordered his uh, world with rules that never cease, that never end, that endure forever. This is God's world, and he's ordered it. And that means here in his word, we have a never-changing owner's manual. We can go to it. No matter what age you find yourself in, no matter what situation you find yourself in, God's word is an enduring revelation. And it's not vague. It's not, it's not a vague word to us like Ikea instruction manuals with generic bubble people that sort of tell you how to put it together, but you really got to put the vagueness together on your own, right? These testimonies never change. We see not just vague things about God, but specifics. It tells us about Him, this enduring Word that gives us life and leads us in life. I mean, aren't you ever tired of the rat race of our world? Have you ever gone on vacation and unplugged and come back and realized everything you missed in the last week really doesn't matter? That in the 24-7 news cycle, it's just another cycle tomorrow. If you miss one, it's not a big deal. I mean, are you ever f tired of feeling like you're not in the know or having to work so hard to stay in the know, to be relevant, that even if you are relevant, you can't enjoy it? Well, the most relevant people know God's enduring revelation. And so you can pray along with the psalmist in verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. To the dust. Not what our world says is relevant. My soul clings to the dust, so give me life according to your word. So if God has created and ordered this world, how does recalling the past give dust clingers like us life? Well, how can we apply this first point? It's a few ways. Our creating, sustaining God is dependable. When you recall the past, you will encounter a God who is dependable. Verse 151, but you are near O oh Lord, and all your commandments are true. When you read the Pentateuch, you will find a God who is never far from his people. He leads them in the wilderness through pillars of fire at night and clouds during the day. He leads them on dry ground through the Red Sea. He leads them across the Jordan River on a dry riverbed. He brings them into the promised land. He gives it to them. He sustains them. He fulfills his promises. He does not fail. And how much of our world has changed in the past few months? You can't go a day without hearing a radio or TV ad with someone saying uncertain times or unsure days. How unsure are the things that this world thought was most sure? Phrases like socially distanced, which didn't even exist a year ago. We hear it all the time. How distant is everyone and everyone feel at the moment, but not our God. He's near and where? In his commandments, in his word. God is near and he is dependable because his word is true. And because his word is true, then God is also unshakable. He is unshakable. Look at verses 89 through 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You have established the earth and it stands fast. By your appointment, they stand this day, for all things are your servants. So because God created and ordered his world, all things then exist to serve him. Everything, everything that happens, everyone in it exists to serve our God. So that means no matter how the earth seems to shake, everything serves at the beckoning of our God. 
He is unshakable. This world is unshakable. Nothing happens apart from his world. It stands fast. Nothing goes outside of him that will undermine his power of sustaining his world. And our God is forever unshakable, even when life seems chaotic. And when you recall the past, you know God is unshakable. And that means then he is inexhaustible. Look at verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. Have you ever bought something or received something that you really wanted only to be unsatisfied with it after a while? Or looking for the next best, greatest thing to find? But <laughs> I've seen a limit to all perfection, but your commandment is exceedingly broad. And God's word is limitless. It is inexhaustible because our God is inexhaustible. You can never be unsatisfied with him. When you ask him to open your eyes to see wonderful things in his law, you'll never come to a point where you've exhausted God's riches. Now, that's not to say you won't feel like it. That's not to say you're going to feel like the psalmist. That's not to say you'll, you're going to have days where you won't well up with wonder when reading God's word. But that's not because of any deficiency in God or his word. That's for us. That's why this guy continually, over and over, prays, open my eyes, help me see, give me life. And often we just give up too quickly. I've got too much to do. This doesn't seem to be working. This isn't sweeter to my taste than honey. I would much rather have a thousand gold pieces right now. And when the reward isn't immediate, we too often give up so quickly. But God is dependable and unshakable and inexhaustible. And His Word, or in His Word, we can explore this limitless perfection. We must tell ourselves our heart won't be satisfied. You know why? Because a thousand gold pieces isn't enough. Because you know how many more gold pieces you'll want when you have a thousand? One more. There's always, a, I mean, there's always a little bit more we can have. We won't be satisfied with anything less than the limitless perfection of God. And it, it stands ready to be enjoyed in His Word. And so the church is the people of God, the people of God's Word in this world, that witness to creation, that there are limits all around us. There are things that will never satisfy. And we can witness to the world of the limited creation as we glory in the limitless perfection of our God. And so when we're people of God's word, as we recall the past, we're going to witness his faithfulness, God's faithfulness, who he is and what he has done in the past. And as we go to his word and his word recalls the past, that will ground us in grace in the present. So his recalling the past grounds us in grace in the present. One of the temptations when reading Psalm 119 is to not see any grace in it. We're tempted to not see any grace here. As if God is saying, I've done all this in the past. Now you have to go do if you want blessing and life. And so we're tempted right from the beginning in verse 1 to see all works and no grace. Verse 1, blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And when you hear blameless, what do you think? And we hear blameless and think, well, that's not me. And I know we read all 176 verses this morning, but I was, I was out before we even got to the end of verse 1. But blameless doesn't mean sinless. And as we see, and if you go to Scripture and you read this, you see saints of old are called blameless. And even in the New Testament, John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were called blameless. But that doesn't mean they were sinless. They're called blameless, not because they've never sinned, but because they hope and believe in God's promises. They hope and believe in this promise-keeping God. They're blameless in that their trust isn't in false gods or false ways, but this God in His ways. That's what we see in uh, verse 149. Hear my voice, because I'm great and have done everything well, according to your steadfast love. 
No, O oh Lord, according to your justice, give me life. You see that pleading there for God to hear and help him by recalling the past? Hear me according to your steadfast love. Not my living, not my ways, but because you're a saving, gracious, promise-making, steadfast, loving God. So you see how recalling the past grounds you in the present? I mean, I mean, get through today. I make it through today, not by the size of my bank account, not by my uh, life going o- according to plan, not by the headlines being okay, but as I draw my life from this God revealed in His Word. And starting each day with God grounds me in the present. It reminds me what life is all about and where to find it. And that's why at the end of verse 40, 149, it says, Give me life. Now, we're tempted again to read that there. Give me life, this pleading for grace. And, and we see the reason why he says it there. The basis of his request looks like it's he's earned it. According to your justice, give me life. But again, we have to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. And the very first part of verse 149 helps us understand the second part. We don't deserve life. We don't. We're not blameless. We're sinful. So what would be just is what? According to your... No... No one, apart from hoping in God's covenant, steadfast love, should say, according to your justice. Because the only thing God would give, apart from those things, is death for our sin. And it would be just, not life. But again, who is the psalmist hoping in? Not what he's done, but in what God has promised and what God will do. He's hoping in God. So those who stake their lives on God's grace and promises in the past, which we can stake our lives on as we encounter them in his word. We can ask God to be just because we're asking that he remember his promises. God will never be unfaithful. So God, according to your justice, God, you are righteous. You will never fail. You will never, ever do something against your promises. So we're saying, God, according to your justice, based on your character, because you're righteous and faithful. Remember your promise to save sinners. And so we're blameless, not because we've never sinned, but by who you hope in. What are you hoping in? We hope in God's promise to not count our sins against us when our faith is in his promise to save. I love how Psalm 32 puts it in verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. So God's past grace fuels our present prayers. It fuels our life with him, our communion with him. And it doesn't just fuel our prayer life, but as we soak ourselves in scripture, we're taught how to live daily in God's world because of God's grace to us in the past. So again, how can we apply this? What does it mean to be grounded in the present? We see four quick ways that recalling the past grounds us in the present. One, recalling the past grounds us in the present by giving us the grace to seek God in His Word. Seeking God in His Word. Look at verse 10. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Now one of the ways Psalm 119 gets a bad rap is that it's more in love with God's word than it is with God. This is a psalm about the Bible, not about God. But we see here in verse 10 that that is untrue. You can't separate those things. He says, with my whole heart, I seek you. The Bible is his commandments. It's it's God's word to us. So we're not worshiping the Bible instead of God, but who the Bible points to. He's not seeking the Bible. He's seeking the God of the Bible. If you want to seek this God, you have to go to him in his word. It is the unfallible rule. It is the divinely inspired source of how to know and see and encounter God. 
And even this, do you see how it's grounded in grace? What's he say there? I will wander if you don't help me. Let me not wander from your commandments. He's pleading for grace. As we know, we are prone to wander. And God's grace creates a people who set themselves wholly to seek God in his word. And know how easily we can wander and plead for grace not to. And so not only do we seek, we're grounded in the present by guarding our lives with his word. So we seek him in his word. We guard our lives with his word. How can a young man, verse 9, keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And so here we see that God's uh, grace in the past doesn't lead to then just living however we want, but God's grace brings us into life with him, a life that's holy and pure. And how does God keep us in this way? And I, 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 I think it's helpful here. I know we often think of this as a purity verse for just young guys. Okay, but this is, I, I think this psalmist is a young man. We don't know who it is. Um, some people think it's David. Uh, because if, if you see how Psalm 119 is laid out with all the Hebrew sections there, and each one, each section's got a different Hebrew letter, uh, that means every line in that section starts with that Hebrew letter over and over and over and over. And then he just goes through all 22 letters. So some people think this is David teaching Solomon the Hebrew ABCs. So he wrote this psalm about it. I actually think it's different. I think it's a young man who wrote this, probably a priest, but wrote this psalm. And so this is an autobiographical verse. He's asking, Lord, how do I keep my way pure? So this does not exclude women or older folks. This is an autobiographical verse, and he's teaching us to ask God how we can pray to keep our way pure. How can we do it? By being so saturated with the word of God that no matter what we face, we know how to walk through our days in a manner pleasing to God. This is the same thing we see in Paul. Walk in a manner worthy of the grace to which you've been called. How can we walk worthy? By knowing God and His Word. And so think about it. When you read things, hear things, uh, watch things, in conversation with people, does it get filtered by the Word abiding in you? Do you ever get like a ding in your head that says, oh, that doesn't sound right? And not a, not a political ding, or a cultural ding, or a I don't like you ding, you know, like you're, you're annoying me ding. N not that, but something like that, that doesn't sound right. Th does the conversations you have and the information you encounter, yes, we need to apply, we got to be Bereans and apply the word to these things, but but when it gets filtered in, as the word abides in you, does, does a ding go off and ever get filtered by the word that's abiding in you? And what grace God has given us in our time. We can carry around his word everywhere we go. And so in, if, if, if you ever find yourself trying to burn a few minutes of time, instead of scrolling through Facebook or playing Candy Crush for five minutes, you can spend a few moments... That's what we see, that the more this young man spent in God's word, his love for it grew, that he longed for it, that his mind kept getting turned back to it, that he wanted to guard his ways. It's, it, it's like that acquired taste, more and more and more. Nothing else satisfies. Everything else I find limits to. This is the only place that I find life and joy and satisfaction. And everything else seems less now the more I feast on this word. And so maybe move all your apps to the second or third page of your screens if you struggle to spend time in his word. And just have the Bible as the only app on that first page. Maybe put a Bible verse on your lock screen to meditate on it through the day. Print out scripture. Or, or keep your, if you're home a lot, Keep, don't close your Bible after your morning read it. Leave it open to something that you, you, you meditate on. So the next time you walk into the kitchen or you walk past your dining room table or you sit on your couch, there's the word open again to help you meditate and guard your life by it. Think about all the other things we guard in our lives. We guard our money. We guard our stuff. 
We lock our houses at night. We guard our possessions. We guard our families. Brothers and sisters, do we guard our souls with the means God has given to keep them? We have his word. And three, not only seeking and guarding, but now we're grounded in the present by guiding, guiding our lives with God's word. Look at verse 105. Most of you know this famous verse. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we see then God doesn't just guard us by his word defensively, but it, he gives us the offense, the grace to walk daily with God in his world. It guides our path. Um, some of you have probably visited Mammoth Cave. I remember going there when I was a, a young kid, and we walked down, 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 down. You get to one of those large caverns, and if you've been there, um, at least I don't know if they still do it, but when I was there, you get into the, one of the big, large underground caverns, and then they turn all the lights off. You know, and you do this, and you can't see anything. You could actually touch your eyeball, because I did, and you still can't see your finger, not just in front of your face, but sticking in your eyeball. You still can't see it. And that's the world we live in, God says. You can see, but it's dark. And without his word showing us where to walk and how to live, we will stumble around in the darkness. And brothers and sisters, where are you going for guidance? What kind of light is guiding your path each day? The news, social media, friends, neighbors. There are sources of all kinds of light all around us that are trying to steer your path. But God's word is a lamp and a light to us. And God's word reminds us that this is God's world. And when you go to it, you see all these things that he has done in the past, all these promises that are guarding us and guiding us, all these ways to walk in his world. So no matter what governments do, no matter what viruses do, no matter what stock markets do, no matter what news you get from a doctor, God has ordered his world and it equips us to live in the present. And we will stumble around if his word is not our light. And friends, circumstances change. It could change this afternoon. But God's word never does. The grass withers. The flowers fade. You will get old and die one day. All of everything that we know, all of life might get turned on its head. And you know it can get worse. Because it seems to have continually done so in this year. But God's word abides forever, which means there's never going to be a situation you can find yourself in where God's word does not give you light. And that doesn't mean you'll find specific situations always addressed in scripture. But when you soak yourself in scripture, the Holy Spirit will bring principles and things to mind and verses to bear to apply and help you wherever you find your feet walking. And so we're grounded in the present, and finally, by meditating on God's word. Meditating, seeking, guarding, guiding, meditating on God's word. Look at verses 98 and 99. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. Now, that's not an excuse, students. <laughs> to uh, opt out of school this fall, all right? That you can have more understanding than all your teachers. But what does it mean? That there is wisdom in this world that you can only find in God's word and that his spirit will teach you when you go to it. And we have to meditate on it then, don't we? Another temptation that I think Satan has tempted uh, people of our time with. It's not only the ease of use and mobility of God's word, but the lie that we've read it if we haven't meditated on it. I can read lots of things and not remember anything 10 seconds, when I, 10 seconds later when I get up. That's why over and over Psalm 119 directs us not to just seek God's word, but to meditate on it, to stake our lives on it. And we meditate on lots of other things. You meditate for your job. You meditate on vacation plans. You meditate on problems your families are having. You meditate on things you, you're going to ask God for. We, we meditate on lots of things. 
Have you ever meditated on a conversation you're going to have with someone, like, in an hour or two or the next day? Or, like, the next time I tell this person, you have that back and forth, so you're like, I'll, I'll be ready for this conversation. We, we do it all the time. We meditate on lots of things. What are your meditations, brothers and sisters? Are you more caught up with the daily events than you are with the enduring word of God? The headlines will change, but God's word abides forever. And so recalling the past then grounds us in life in the present, which leads then and helps us to look towards the future. That's our last point, the future. God's word recalls the past to ground us in the present as we look towards the future. Look at verse 123. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. When God's grace in the past grounds you in the present, what you live for daily will change. What you hope for daily will change. What you long for daily will change. The things that cause anxiety in the past will less and less do so. The cares of your soul become less concerned with self and more concerned with God. And in other words, recalling the past, which then grounds you in the present, changes. It transforms what you long for in the future, what we hope for, what we're living for. We become God's people in his world who long for his salvation to come. You can join John at the end of his book of Revelation and say, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We become people who pray and long for what God teaches us to long for. And so one way to ask what we're hoping in, what we long for, is to ask what you hope in. What are you hoping for today? What things trigger anxiety? What things trigger fear? What things trigger the tight grip around the things of this world? What are you hoping in? Look at verse 114. One way to answer that is to evaluate us in light of 114. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. When things that change quickly are your hiding place, you're going to be anxious, worried, fearful, angry people. But he says, you are my hiding place. You're my shield. The church is the people of all the people in the world who hide themselves in God, who shield themselves in his love and promises, the people who hope in his word. So that doesn't mean we ignore the headlines of the day, but it does change our response to them, doesn't it? If God is dependable and unshakable and inexhaustible, how can that not change how you respond to anything that comes your way, to any headline you see, to any news you receive? But friends, you can't, you can't turn to something you don't know. You can't hide somewhere you don't know where to go. You can't hope in someone you don't know. And so the great grace of this psalm is that it, it finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That's the good news of the Gospel of John, how it begins. Jesus Christ is the Word who was with God and is God, and was made flesh and who came to dwell among us. So when we talk about who is our hiding place, it's not the Bible. It's who the Bible points to. Our, our hiding place is in Jesus. Our blamelessness is, is by faith in Jesus. We're enabled to understand the Bible and to walk in His ways by the grace Jesus gives us because His Spirit is within us. God's people are given life as the Spirit unites us to Jesus by grace, through faith, as He grants repentance of sin. And so Psalm 119 uses the phrase, Give me life. Give me life. Eight times. Give me life. And that, friends, is the question of not just our time, but every time. Everyone is seeking life. The good life. The blessed life. Blessed is the one who walks in God's ways. Blessed is the one who orders his life according to God's word. And so, friends, you can have true joy and peace, even when the world all around us has none of it. Look at verse 165. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing 
can make them stumble. And it's not just the world around us that you look around and has no peace. Not even great peace, not even a little peace. No peace. And unfortunately, it's not just the world. You look around the church, and I don't, I, I don't mean just five ones, but I mean the, the people who say they are Christians, who, who claim to be the people of God. And 2020 has shown that we're trying to find peace in everything else but God in His Word. Great peace have those who love your law. If we don't have peace, maybe it's because we're trying to find it in other things and other places than God and His Word. And I don't know about you, but I want great peace. We're not saying we have it all the time and we never fail, but that where do we turn? Who do we turn to for this great peace? I mean, isn't it a grace that God's hand is ready to help you by His Word? He will give it to you. Nothing can make them stumble, not even death. We have great peace, even as we face death. And God's hand is ready to help you by His Word. Which, look, look how, two, two verses to end. Look how Psalm, ver, uh, Psalm 119, verse 72 talks about God's word. It's better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Hmm. What an invitation. What an invitation to life and joy and peace, security, hope. It's better, and it's here, and it's free. If you don't have one, we'll give you one. It's free. And brothers and sisters, may we have the grace to delight in God's word more than any other treasure in this world. And if you find yourself far from the life-giving pastures of God's, God's word and God himself this morning, hear the grace of the last verse in this psalm, verse 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. This is the same guy who started off, I'm blameless. <laughs> I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And the wonder of Psalm 119 is, is not that it's going to make us worship the Bible instead of God, but that it's God's word. It points us to the God of the Bible. That here, you want, we talked about abiding last week, and, and God gives us freely the means. Come, eat freely. Come, enjoy freely. Come, have great peace. Learn how to ask God to give us life. Learn where to find it. Learn how to walk in his world. And isn't it a wonder that the God who speaks is the same God who seeks? Seek your servant. I have gone astray. We are prone to wander, but our God is a speaking, seeking shepherd who will not let his sheep go astray. And so five points. May his grace cause us to delight in God by being the people of his word all the days of our lives. Let's pray. So Father, we ask that we would order our lives according to your word, that you would open our eyes, that we may see wonderful things in it of your past faithfulness, of your present nearness and grace, and of the hope we have for a future, because you who began a good work are faithful to complete it. So help us set our eyes on heaven. Help us help one another towards that great end. Teach us. Give us life according to your word, we pray. Help us delight in your word. Help us love it, and not for the sake of being people of the Bible, but so that we would more and more be people of the God of the Bible. Plant your word deep in us, we pray. Teach us. Help us to walk in your ways and in hoping in you alone, we pray. Amen. Let's stand and conclude in worship together.